Well, again, howdy. We are in Exodus chapter 16, so if you want to navigate there in your Bibles or your electronic gizmo thingies, Exodus chapter 16, the message tonight is entitled, Be Good and Eat Your Manna. Be good and eat your manna. Now, last time we were together, we read that Israel was without water for three days. The Lord led them to a place where there was no water. And then finally, he led them to a place where there was water. And when they got there, they rushed toward that that huge pool. And, uh, you know, there's two to three million people, by the way, in Israel at this time. Huge group of people. Like two to three times the size of the whole Memphis metropolitan area. Imagine that. And so they're all rushing toward this water and they drink it in and then immediately they spit it out. Why? Why did they spit out that water? The water was bitter. What was the name of the place that they... They named it bitter, but in Hebrew the word bitter is what? Does anybody remember? Mara, that's right. They, they called it Mara. That, and by the way, Mara did not make them bitter, but it revealed the bitterness that was in their hearts already. They accused Moses... Uh, of, and also of God, of leading them to their death. But then God showed Moses a tree and instructed him to cast it into the bitter waters. And then God created this miracle for the bitter waters became sweet. The tree, and I have very little doubt what shape that tree was in. You know, it won't surprise me at all to find out when we get to heaven that that tree was in the shape of a cross. And so they cast that in, and the bitter waters were made sweet. Sometimes we can become embittered toward God for where he brings us or where he's not bringing us. Anybody here feel like their lives are on hold? And yeah, several people do, yeah. Sometimes it's easy, isn't it, to become bitter, like, God, come on, you know, don't you see that? As if the Lord's like, oh, what, really? I'm sorry, you know. I had you on hold for a while. Let me get back to you. No, the Lord knows what he's doing. And so at that point, the Lord uh, comes to us and says, hey, you know, you got bitterness there. Here's how to get rid of it. Cast the tree in. Cast in the cross of Christ. And when you focus upon Jesus and all that he's done for you, and, and, and what did you deserve? What did I deserve? I deserve judgment. But yet the cross of Christ, Jesus took my judgment upon himself. And so my bitter experiences then become sweet because now I see that God loves me. Loves me to death. How much do you love me, Jesus? Oh, I love you this much. And then in that position, he allowed us to nail him to the cross. And so my bitterness can become sweet when I cast in the cross of Christ. By the way, this wouldn't be the last time that Israel was led to a place of thirst, and we'll get to that next week. But the lack of water would become such a source of contention that it negatively impacted even Moses' future. When all was said and done, Moses, because of the water issues, Moses was on the outside of the promised land looking in, not able to go in. All because of water. Well, after Marah, the Lord led them to a place of 12 wells and 70 palm trees where there was plenty and abundance and they just kicked back and relaxed for a couple few weeks at least. The name of that place is called Elim. They also translated porticos or porch. And, you know, what porches are great for is putting on a rocking chair and a glass of tea and just kicking back and doing nothing. And that's what Israel was experiencing there in the place named the porches. And they're just kicking back and relaxing. And isn't that what God does for us? He leads us through a difficult place in our life, and then he brings us to a new place of blessing. It would be nice to stay there. But we don't grow in those places. When things are great and wonderful and restful and relaxing, we, we never do grow. So God takes us from there, leads us on to the next place of difficulty. I love what Pastor Chuck Smith told us one time. A bunch of us young, know-nothing pastors, and, and Chuck, Pastor Chuck was there and he said, Now guys, just about the time you get one situation in the church fixed and out the back door, here comes a new one in the front door. I was like, well, does it ever end? No, it never ends. <laughs> so it's just, that's life, isn't it? Just about the time you get it figured out, this situation, and it's done, and okay, now, now I can rest, right? Well, maybe for a little bit. But something's coming. Something's coming. And so, by the way, when God led them to this difficult places, it revealed also other negative things that were in their hearts. 
There are places of testing, not so that God could see what was in there, but so that the people could see what was in there. God already knew. Just like when we are tested, and the testing of our faith, the Bible says, produces patience. Why? Because we're impatient. We, you know, we, we're used to microwaves. You know, popcorn, do you remember when you have to wait for the, sto- the coils on the stove to get red, and you'd put some oil in, put a kernel of corn in there, and then finally when it popped, you put in the rest, and you'd shake it back and forth? How long did it take, like three hours or something to make, make you a pan? Remember that? Who were, no, none of you. Yeah, you're too young, but several of us do. Okay, well, you know, today, a bag, three and a half minutes, bing, done. And sometimes three and a half minutes is a little too long. It's, hmm, smells burnt. But we're used to like microwave instantaneous gratification. And that's what we expect with God sometimes. Lord, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I want growth. I want real growth. And it takes time. It takes time. And so God puts us through trials, not so that he can see what's in us, but so that we will see what's in us, and how much we need his forgiveness and his grace. Well, in verses 1 through 21, God provides quail and, what is it? God provides quail and, what is it? What is it? What does manna mean? What is it? Yeah, that's right. So if you're wondering, the word manna literally means, what is it? So God provides quail and, what is it? They journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. By the way, this <laughs> didn't mean that that was a place where everybody went to sin. This was a, a wilderness that was there by Mount Sinai, therefore the abbreviated form, the, the, the wilderness of sin. Israel did sin there. Of course, they sinned pretty much everywhere they went. And, but it's just coincidental that it was named the wilderness of sin. And uh, which is between Elim and Sinai, On the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So they departed on the first month on the 15th day, roughly the day of Passover. So now they've been in the wilderness a grand total of one month. Isn't it odd how after Elam, or that place of, 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 uh, you know, comfort and resting, right on the heels of Mara, which was just a couple few weeks earlier, In less than a month's time after this wonderful experience, and in one month's time of of what? Remember what happened to them a month from this point? Remember how they came to the Red Sea and it parted and they went through on dry ground and then the Egyptian army tried to chase them in and, and then God closed the waters over them, giving them a really good thorough bathing? And there were dead Egyptians lining the shores of the, of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel are now praising God and dancing with tambourines. And, and just the Lord has uh, thrown the horse and its rider in the sea. Praise God for our deliverance. In a month's time from that great victory, now they're fretful, complaining, murmuring against God for where he had them. Doesn't that remind you of somebody? Like the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror? You know, has the Lord done any great things for you in your lifetime? Recently, has God done a great work for you? Then why do we forget that at the next trial? Why do we worry and, and kind of fall apart when the next thing, oh, but this is big. Oh, nothing's too big for the Lord. Everything's small potatoes for him. But we forget that, don't we? Just like Israel. When you're reading this, it's like we're, we're reading our own story here. So they came out, and, and uh, God was, was with them. He was providing for them, but yet they just didn't get it. Notice verse 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So they're complaining against Moses and Aaron. We don't like where you're taking us. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Who was leading them? Was Moses and Aaron leading the children of Israel through the wilderness? No, it was God. How was God leading them? Who remembers? The cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So they're like, hey, Moses, hey, Aaron, we don't like where you're leading us. And Moses and Aaron are like, "Uh, the cloud, duh. You know, when it moves, we move. You're complaining against us, but really you're complaining against God. Because he's the one leading. He's the one guiding 
You know, when people don't like how the Lord is leading them, they will often find someone else to blame. It's just human nature. It's just how it is. The children of Israel said to them, Oh, no, no. This, this blows my mind. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Oh, we should have just died at the Passover with all the firstborn of the Egyptians because before we, we sat by the pots of meat. And when we ate bread to the full, not true. They never ate bread to the full. And they never had wonderful pots of meat. They were in slavery. They had what some might call selective memory disorder. They're only remembering the things they want to remember. You know, sometimes a person who has kind of a riotous life will get saved. And then as time goes on, they, they kind of look back on their old life with rose-colored glasses and think, whoa, what, when I was, you know, in the world, I was one party after another, I, all the, the stuff in life I could ever want, and then I got saved and God took it all away. Really? You don't remember the bad stuff, huh? You know, you just want to remind the people of, you know, waking up in the morning not knowing where they were because of the drunken binge, the, the drug-induced coma they put themselves in the night before, and the vomit on their pillow, and the, oh my, who's this, you know, strangers with them, and all the, hor- and the DUIs and the horrible scrapes that they got themselves into, and the pain and the misery that they caused everybody around them, but oh, we forget those things. And, and just like the children of Israel, they were beaten as slaves. They were forced into hard bondage labor seven days a week, 12 months out of the year, year after year, for 400 years. And Pharaoh had ordered that all of their children, all their male children, were to be cast into the Nile River to kill them to keep their populations down. Oh, but they forgot about that. Things got a little tough and there. Oh, the old life was so wonderful. We sat by the pots of meat. We ate bread to the full. You, Moses, have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Really? You really think that that was God's intent? To bring you out, deliver you from your hard bondage in order to kill you later on? By the way, they were hungry. The Lord never faulted them for their hunger. God knows. He never faulted them for being thirsty. God knows we hunger. God knows we thirst. He never faults us for having a legitimate need. But as he faulted Israel, he can fault us too if we complain that God isn't doing his part. If we complain about the Lord, that's where God finds fault because it's not God. It's not the Lord. If Israel had simply come to God and said, Lord, We're hungry. We don't have any food. You've provided for us in the past. Would you provide for us now? I'm sure the story would read, and the Lord smiled upon them and said, absolutely, and then he would open the windows of heaven and and bless them. He did that anyway for them. We're going to read that the Lord rained down manna upon them, rained down bread from heaven. If I were God, I would have rained down fire for complaining about how I delivered them and saved them and spared them from their from their death and their their bondage in Egypt. So God faulted them for complaining, not about that they were hungry, but for complaining. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. (laughs) Isn't that amazing how God responds even to our complaining? How gracious the Lord is? How good God is? We complain, and what does God do? He blesses. It's just amazing. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. This is to be a daily daily, uh, work. That I might test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, the Lord would soon give Israel his law. But right here beforehand, he's testing them with a simple set of instructions every day. You go out and gather how much food you need for that day. On the sixth day, you gather twice as much because on the seventh day, you're going to rest. And that leftover will keep and be good on that day of rest. That was a test. Did Israel obey the simple set of instructions? (laughs) Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
You know, really, they should have known that already. There are a bunch of dead Egyptian soldier corpses lining the Red Sea that should have showed them, yes, the Lord had indeed brought them out of Egypt. And in the morning, so in the evening, you're going to see something amazing. Then in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. And Moses says, but what are we that you complain against us? You know, we're not the one leading in the cloud and the pillar. That's, that's the Lord. So you're complaining about us. You're really complaining about God. Verse 8, also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. You know, if we, if we blame others for where we are in life, we're really blaming God. Because it's the Lord who has brought us here. It's the Lord who has put us in this place. And instead of complaining, the Bible tells us that we're to rejoice even over the fact that God put us here in Memphis. I know this is hard to receive. This is very difficult. But the Bible tells us to rejoice not just in the Lord, but even for the things that God has done. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, giving thanks always for, not in just in all things, but for all things. Lord, thank you that you brought me here to Memphis. Really? Can you say that with a straight face? Yes. Thank you, Lord. You brought me here to this city, to this place, in such a time as this. Because you have a plan. You have a good work to be done. And for whatever reason, you've chosen to use me. He's chosen to use you. He's brought you to this place. You know, so often we... We miss out on what God wants to do today because we're looking beyond today to the future and for where we really think we ought to be. No, God has you here today, right now, for a purpose. And we will do ourselves all a great favor if we get in line with God's will and rejoice in where God has. Now, maybe God will move you on some other day. Maybe you'll get to Montana or Colorado where it's really, really pretty, or Wyoming, or wherever it might be, or California. Look, I live there. You you don't need to go there. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Anyway, maybe you'll get to your heart's desire, but, you know, if we look beyond where we are today, we're going to miss out on the great things that God wants to do right here, right now, in us and through us. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are commanded to to do. And if you do so, you're going to find that your life's going to be better. You're going to be able to enjoy much more than you do. Verse 9, then Moses spoke to Aaron, say to the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Uh Uh-oh. God says to Moses, you tell them, I want to speak to them. Whoops. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. That radiance, that glory. By the way, the Hebrew word here for glory in this verse is the word chabod, which means weight or heaviness. There's another word that is used for glory in other places, Shekinah, and people like to say that word a whole lot. I don't know why, but they, Shekinah, it's so cool. But here, the word for glory, and often when you read about the glory of God in the Old Testament is chabod, which means heaviness or weightiness. You remember years ago saying, whoa, that's heavy. <laughs> you know, just, whoa, just the, the seriousness of the moment. That's what Israel was feeling at this point. Not some radiance and glory and majesty and and just in awe and wonder and filled with worship. Oh, no, no. This is different. This was heaviness. At this point, they are experiencing the very heavy hand of God. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat. Remember, they were complaining, oh, we had our pots of meat, our flesh pots and You know, people today still long for their old flesh pots. (laughs) You know, the old ways and all. But at twilight you shall eat meat. 
And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. They say, oh, we remember when we were always filled with bread. God says, no, you're going to get full. Really full of bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Again, they should have known. They had seen the ten plagues. They were delivered through the Red Sea and the Egyptian army killed in the Red Sea. Uh, the miraculous uh, Mara, bitter waters made sweet. They had seen God. They should have known that he is the Lord. But the Lord's going to show them again. You know, sometimes we doubt. And isn't it cool that the Lord doesn't just say, oh man, I'm done with you. I'm just tired of your doubting. That's it. Next car I can command, I'm going to have him run over you. He doesn't do that, does he? No, he's patient. He reveals himself to, to us again and again. So it was, verse 13, that night, quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay all around the camp. Now, yes, there are some quail in that area, but never before nor since had there ever been a, a huge flock of quail that could satisfy the hunger of two to three million people. Well, there would be another time afterward for Israel, but it was a total miracle at this point. Quail in the desert, and in one place, all gathered together in one place, enough to feed two to three million people. What an awesome miracle. By the way, doesn't that look good? It'd be nice to have a, a quail grill out someday. Well, the next morning, after the quail that night, the next morning, God miraculously provided a complete healthy breakfast with multiple spiritual implications. Many, many spiritual applications. Verse 14. So there's dew on the ground, and when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small, small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? In Hebrew they said, manna? What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Again, manna means what is it? As God dealt with Israel in the wilderness, all of the things that we read about were designed by God not just to minister to them, but to use them as examples to us for our benefit, for our learning, for our growth. Now, you keep your finger there in Exodus. Turn to the right of your Bible to 1 Corinthians. It says six, uh, chapter 10, verses 6 through 11, but we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 6. 1 Corinthians 10, go ahead and turn there. Verses 1 through 6, where the Holy Spirit through Paul tells them and you and me this. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. So the Lord wants us to know these things. You're here tonight because God wants you to know these things. Maybe you've never studied through Exodus or maybe just given it a cursory reading. But God wants you to be here. He wants you to know these things. I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, cloud by day, all passed through the sea, they escaped on dry ground, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. God birthed the nation of Israel through the Passover and through the, the, the crossing of the Red Sea. All ate the same spiritual, spiritual food? Spiritual food? I thought it was physical food. Yes, it was. But there are spiritual implications, and we'll get to them in just a little bit. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That's always fascinated me, that verse. The rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember how Moses, we'll read about that next week, he struck the rock and water came out. The Lord showed him a rock and said, go hit that rock, and he did, and water came out. But then toward the end of their wilderness wanderings, they were thirsty again, and they said, we want water. And Moses uh, was told by God, go speak to the rock. Rock was struck once. You don't need to strike it again. Go speak to the rock, and water will come out. So he went to the rock, and he was mad at Israel. Must I always bring forth for you water? Bang, bang, bang. He starts hitting the rock again. Well, God was gracious, and he, and he opened the rock, and water came gushing out, and Israel 
uh, was filled and their thirst was quenched. But then God said to Moses, look, you've misrepresented me. I wasn't mad at them. And you've ruined my analogy. Man, I had this super cool analogy that the rock was to be struck once. But after that, all we need to do is speak to him and he gives us living water. And so that's, that's how Moses was disqualified from going into the promised land here. But the spiritual rock, drinking that spiritual drink from the rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That, that, did a rock actually follow them? Was there, they, they'd go camp and, hey, what's that rock doing here again? You know, Is that what happened? I don't know, maybe. Wouldn't surprise me. Not at all. But verse 5, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That was God's sign. I'm not, not pleased with these people. Now, these things, here's the key. These things, all the things about Exodus, in fact, all the things about the Old Testament, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They are our examples. Later on, it says it's for our learning for our instruction. All that God did with them all has shadows, types, images, and they all somehow, some way point to Jesus, including manna itself, the bread from heaven. Jesus stated clearly that manna foreshadowed himself. You remember when Jesus miraculous, I'm sure you were there, he miraculously fed 5,000 men plus women and children with five small loaves of bread and two small fish? An absolute miracle. And afterward, they gathered up 12 baskets full of fragments. Just the Lord multiplied the bread and the fish, and everybody was so full, so glutted. Well, just like you and I experience, we eat and eat and eat on Thanksgiving, and we're so full, yet we're able to somehow choke down a piece of pumpkin pie. And so we're laying in bed at night miserable, but then we wake up the next morning, we go, I'm starving, you know, because we've stretched our stomachs out, and now it wants to be full again. Well, that's what happened to the 5,000 men plus women and children. They came back the next day to Jesus, not because they were in awe of his miraculous power, but because they were hungry again. That's why they came back. So now look at John chapter 6. And we're going to be here for just a little bit. John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answers, you know, you're here. And they, well, you know, it's breakfast time. Well, don't labor for the food that perishes. And so in verse uh, 26 of John chapter 6, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the sign. It's not that you're impressed with the fact that I am the miracle worker, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And now you have this entitlement mentality that that I'm just here to serve you food all the time. Do not labor for the food which perishes. You're you're all striving for physical food, but boy, that's short-sighted because you're going to be hungry again. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal on him. So labor for the food that is eternal. Now they didn't get it, and so they said to him, Well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So what, 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 how, how can we multiply bread and fish? <laughs> and Jesus answered and said, and This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. What must I do to get right with God? Believe in him. Whom he sent. What can I do to to work God's works? Just believe in him. Trust in him. Therefore they said to him, Okay, well, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? Or what work will you do? Hello, five loaves, two small fish becoming enough food for over maybe 15,000 people? Sign's already been done yesterday. And you're still looking for a sign. It just showed that these people were not interested in the things of God. They just wanted to fill their bellies. Just wanted to fill their bellies. And then they said, verse 31, Our fathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he, and they were referring to Moses here, not to God. Because they're looking at Jesus as potentially a leader who would feed them. Just like in their minds, Moses had. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven but my father 
And my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So that was physical bread. But my Father, who gave them physical bread, is now giving you true bread, heavenly bread. For the bread of God is he, not an it, but he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, well, Lord, and they're thinking still physical, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Well, at this point, you know, they're, they're no longer thinking straight. And so Jesus, to further confuse them, <laughs> in verse 48 said, I am the bread of life. Now your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he's speaking of himself, he will live forever. We partake of Jesus spiritually as we partake of bread physically. See, the Lord wants us to be in a relationship with him where we derive all of our sustenance, all of our spiritual nourishment from feeding of him. He's the living bread and also he has given to us the written heavenly bread, the word of God. And we feed upon Jesus as we pray and as we read the Bible. And when we do so, then we receive spiritual sustenance that lasts forever and ever and ever. And that's how Jesus wants us to feed off of him. Through prayer and through his word. But the people, they, they're just thinking physical and so they're not getting the point that Jesus is trying to make. And he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Verse, verse 52, the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, oh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you partake of him in such a way, just as we would physical food to sustain our bodies. If we're not partaking of Jesus, we, we have no life in us. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Now this is the bread which came from heaven. Not, and here's the point, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, but he who eats this bread, speaking of himself, will live forever. Communion is a beautiful picture of how we should be conducting ourselves on a daily basis. As we eat the bread that represents his, his broken body and drink the cup that represents his shed blood, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, as the Bible says. But we're also internalizing these physical things, which tells us that that is how we are to approach our relationship with Jesus. We are to receive him, come to him. How many times do you eat a day? At least three meals, maybe? Sometimes more? Well, you know, we are to partake of Jesus as if we're, our souls are hungry. And we're to come to him early and often. And when we do, our souls get satisfied. We get filled up. And Jesus said, those who have eternal life are those who come to me. And they feed. And they receive. They're in my word. Now, later on, Jesus, to clear up the issue of whether or not he's speaking of cannibalism, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he clearly said to the disciples, the words that I speak to you are spirit. And they are life. So they're, they're to be taken spiritually, not literally. When you eat the, the, the matzah and you drink the grape juice, you're not eating and drinking the literal body and blood of Jesus because he said that these words are spiritual. But he made the point here that the wilderness manna was a foreshadowing of him being the heavenly bread of of life. Now, if that's true, and it is, then what we read about the manna somehow, some way relates to Jesus 
as being the true bread from heaven. The physical properties of manna somehow, someway speak of the truths of our Lord Jesus. So, so I want to look at a couple of things here. First of all, manna came down. It descended and rested on the ground. Even so, Jesus came down from heaven. Second thing was, when Israel first saw the manna, it was small. Tiny, right? When the world first saw Jesus, he was small. He was a baby. Baby in a manger, very approachable. Unassuming. Not intimidating in the least, but welcoming. Also, manna was round, without beginning, without end. Whenever I, I do a wedding ceremony for somebody, I will uh, say, what then shall be the symbol of your love? And I'll be handed the rings, and I'll say, these rings being circular in form, without beginning, without end, may they remind you of the never-ending love that God has for you. Without beginning, Jesus is eternal God. Eternity past, Jesus always existed. And without end... Hey, his kingdom will have no end. He's coming back soon to establish his kingdom and it will never, ever, ever end. Never have to listen to the candidates lie about their promises. Try to deceive us into voting for them. No, Jesus is gonna rule and reign forever and ever. Also, where was manna when they went to pick it up? Where was it? It's on the ground. They had to stoop. They had to bow. In order to get it, they had to humble themselves. And the same is true with us. In order for us to be saved, we need to humble ourselves. We need to admit we're sinners. And that only through Jesus can we be saved. Also, manna, it was very white, like snow, like frost. I love what Isaiah says. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And there are many other properties about manna that relate to Jesus, and we'll deal with them as we, as we come to them. But verse, back in Exodus verse, chapter 16, verse 16, so the Lord says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it, manna, according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So manna was to be gathered daily, enough for each person's daily need. You know, if we want to be spiritually healthy, we need to come to Jesus every day. And we need to do it in the morning. In the morning, I, I, I love what I, I heard one pastor say, if I get with Jesus in the morning first thing, then my evenings as I lay there are much better. I don't have that much really to confess to God, but I've noticed that when I don't get with Jesus early in the morning, boy, the night is like, well, Lord, I'm sorry for that, and I wish I would have done that. And So starting the day off with Jesus just makes the whole day better. You know, and, and, and early will I seek thee, King David said. There's wisdom in that. One, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, who was a famous preacher back in the 1800s, said, I dare not see the face of a man until I have first sought after the face of God. Oh, wow, that's cool. That's, that's, that's it right there. They were to get it in the morning. Israel was. And if they went out later on, they'd find that it wasn't there anymore. Get it in the morning. That's what the Lord's saying. Come to him in the morning. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered, verse 17, some more, some less, depending on how hungry they were, how big they were. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. By the way, how much bread, how much of this manna would it have taken to feed two to three million people on a daily basis? One estimate was 4,700 
tons to feed all the people daily. And then on Friday, when they're supposed to gather twice as much, that'd be 9,000 tons. That's a lot of manna. The children of Israel did so. Every man gathered. Now, this is so far so good. They're doing what they needed to do, what God said. But verse 19, And Moses said, Let none, let no one leave any of it till morning. So eat it all up. Don't try to have any leftovers. Don't think that there might not be some tomorrow. There will be. They'll be out there for you. So don't think you need to hoard any of it and stockpile it and prep for it. <laughs> no, just eat what you need today. Notwithstanding, verse 20, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. <laughs> and Moses was very angry with them. You know, some doubted that God was going to provide for them the next day. So they did what they thought was prudent, the best thing, what was right in their own eyes. They kept some leftovers. But in so doing, they disobeyed the Lord. And leftovers bred worms and stank. You know, here's a lesson. Disobedience, regardless of how prudent you think you are, disobedience always stinks. <laughs> Verse 21. So they gathered it every morning... Every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. So get it first thing as you can. Get into the Bible first thing in the morning because later on you're just going to find you just don't have the time to do it. Oh, read the Bible and pray at lunchtime. Well, you know, you get busy. It's hard to do it then. First thing in the morning. Verses 22 through 31, failure in light of a miracle. So it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today. Boil what you will boil. Lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until morning. By the way, manna was really all they needed and really all they could want, because it could be prepared in many different ways, and in each different way, it would take on a different consistency, a different texture, and even a different flavor. It was all that they could need and all that they could want. By the way, Jesus is all that we could ever need and all that we should ever want. And he's never boring. Never. So they laid it up until morning as Moses commanded, but Miraculously, this time it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Obedience never stinks, by the way. Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find any in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So he gather twice as much on the sixth day. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. <laughs> Golly. What's wrong with these people? And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be a blessing. Get twice as much as you'd need to the day before so that I can bless you with rest the next day. You don't have to get out of bed. You stay in bed all day if you want. The Lord is giving the Sabbath. He gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. You know, even that rest speaks of Jesus. He's our Sabbath rest. He has gathered us into his kingdom. He's done the work that we might enter into his rest. And the house, verse 31, house of Israel called its name manna. It was like, wasn't exactly, but it was like White coriander seed, maybe in size, texture. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Mmm, sweet to the taste. I'm sure the kids loved it. Reminds me of like sweet, flaky biscuits loaded with butter and honey. You know, that was manna. And without the fat causing calories, might I add. Completely nutritious, everything they needed, and, and, and they would have been fine even without a delicious cup of coffee. It was everything they needed. They didn't need anything else. They shouldn't have wanted anything else. Even so, Jesus is all we need. His word 
And prayer, it's all we need. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. May we come to him every morning, feeding upon him. Verses 32 through 36, keep some as a testimony. We're almost done here. Hang in with me. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So they're going to keep now a, a, a pot of it, a jar of it, uh, and it won't breed worms and stink. It, God will miraculously sustain it throughout many, many generations. And Moses and Aaron, uh, Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it. Lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Now, where did this pot of manna eventually be, uh, was it placed? Who remembers? In the Ark of the Covenant. There were two other things in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, technically three other things because one of them was a two-parter. What else was in the ark? The two tablets, Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod that budded. All that speaks of Jesus. And when we get to the, the building of the tabernacle and the ark, we'll, we'll see how all of that relates to our Lord Jesus. And one of the cool things about the ark, it was made out of wood, but then overlaid with gold. And, you know, that speaks of Jesus, his humanity, and his deity. That he's fully man, but yet fully God as well. And we'll get to more of that later on. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. The children of Israel ate manna 40 years, and until they came uh, to an inhabited land, they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So God sustained them, but then they came to the border, and they no longer needed it. God promises to take care of you until the day that he calls you home to heaven. Until that day. Now, in verse 36, love this verse. Now, an omer, in case you're wondering, is one-tenth of an ephah. Oh, hold that. Perfect, I get it now. When, if, if you do the research and the math, it works out that an omer was just under a gallon. So each person would collect just under a gallon's worth of this this manna, this stuff, and it would last them throughout an entire day. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 17. Israel has seen God provide. He provides miraculously for them every day for 40 years. You would think, okay, they're never going to complain again. They know God is with them, and God is providing for them, but no, they're going to complain again. So read ahead in chapter 17, and be ready for next week. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for this time and your word. Uh, Lord, we, we do want to ask your blessing upon Man Up Day. Should you tarry, Lord? Uh, we want to pray that your, your spirit would be upon us. And uh, Lord, you'd be with Pastor Sandy Adams. And Lord, may his flight, flights be safe. And may you just fill him with your spirit and give us all ears to hear what you're going to say through him to us. Uh, Lord, help us to just come to you every day. Lord, in the morning to seek your face, to just take a moment to read your word, feed upon your word, and to feed upon you, Lord, as we pray. Lord, that we would just, our souls would be enriched with the true bread that comes from heaven. Lord, that'll sustain us throughout the day, and the days are gonna be much better. Lord, we're gonna be better for doing so. We know that. So Lord, help us to take you up on that and to do these things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Perfectly fine. Now, if you're bumping into people and creating a mosh pit, then we're going to talk, you know. And if your expression somehow, someway impedes others, distracts others, then obviously you don't want to do that. But moving a little bit, go for it. I saw one lady tonight doing that. That's perfectly fine. I won't comment on the quality of it, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now, notice the... Miriam became a worship leader for the women. And um, there are wonderful roles that women have in the church. And, of course, there's just the one role that women don't have in the church. And I won't even go there tonight. We'll deal with that some other time. Verse 21. By the way, there are some roles that men are not supposed to have in the church as well. Men are not supposed to bear children. And I'm perfectly fine with, with that. I, I don't want to be a child bearer. I've seen it done. <laughs> Praise God, I'm a man. 
Miriam answered them saying, sing to the Lord. So sing to him again. He has triumphed gloriously. Basically, she's repeating what she's already heard what the Lord said through Moses. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider is thrown into the sea. It's interesting. She's just repeating what she's heard, but it's a fresh experience for her in the moment. I'm not looking for new revelation because there is none. When people say they have a new revelation, man, it's like warning, danger, danger, look out. You know, people that come up with these new revelations, they're, they're not true. Whatever is new, I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, whatever is new is not true. Whatever is true is not new. I'm not looking for new revelation. What I am looking for are fresh new experiences with that which has always been true. Even though it was written 2,000, 5,000 years ago, still I can have a fresh experience. You know, as I was reading through this today, it was just fresh. It was a brand new experience with that which has always, always been true and just really revitalized my heart and get my mind right that, man, worship's important because it's for God and he loves it when God's people worship him. He inhabits the praises of Israel, he, he says in the Psalms. And if he does that with Israel, how much more for the church? And so with Miriam, this fresh new experience with, with that which has already been true. That's what I pray for us. Fresh experience with that which has always been true. Hey, that's all I got. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for this night, for your grace, your mercy upon us. Lord, in your mercy, we see how you have delivered us from all of our enemies. You've overthrown them, and you uh, are preparing a place for us. You are giving us gifts, and you are one day going to come personally for us and take us home to heaven. And Lord, we wonder why it's been so long, but we trust you. And, and Lord, we do know that your, your patience means the salvation of others. Lord, I pray you would teach us how to violently use the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. How to violently use these wonderful spiritual weapons in order to deliver people from the clutches of Satan and from the, the, the death sentence of sin. And so, Lord, please guide us. Give us gifts that we need in order that we might be the best bride we can be. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen.